Okay, now we're going to look at uh, some government regulations and how they impact uh, technology either for the providers or for the payers. So systems supporting government funded programs reporting requirements are a very, very difficult challenge for organizations and there are a couple reasons for this. First of all, changing regulations make it very difficult uh, to keep up with how the systems are supposed to operate and those will include reporting formats, uh, specific data elements, format of data elements, even the timing of uh, said reports are problematic. For example, you may only have 15 days for a particular report from month end close. Uh, that makes it very, very difficult if you don't have the data in a concise format ready to go. Uh, government bureaucracy makes it difficult to get support from the agency. Uh, eventually, if you get into this, you'll try and get some support or some guidance from one of the agencies, and the support that they give you is never quite adequate enough, and chances are it's because they don't understand the rules themselves uh, in many cases. Government systems are usually not ready to handle the regulations themselves. That's a clear case of what has been going on with the health information, health insurance exchanges, where certain systems are just not fully ready uh, to handle uh, the health insurance benefits uh, schedules that are being provided by the um, insurance companies. But this occurs at common, uh, this is commonplace, this is not something specific to healthcare, it's just the nature of uh, dealing with government systems. Many times information is not available in a format that's required by the regulations. So, for example, if you take the EDI standard uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, the data which just wasn't available in those formats and companies had to pay a significant amount of money to consultants or firms to actually help them get the data into that format. Penalties are sometimes ambiguous, so you never know whether or not you're going to be levied a heavy fine or not a heavy fine if something goes wrong. Uh, and finally, the regulations themselves are ambiguous, and no one is quite sure how to interpret certain rules. Uh, for example, it wasn't really until 2010 that certain violations of HIPAA were actually uh, penalized. However, it would have been kind of assumed or inferred that that should have happened a lot sooner, but due to ambiguity with the uh, regulations, it's just never quite clear. So, a quick uh, thing about the HIPAA review. Uh, this is HIPAA is one of the key regulations that everyone who's in healthcare must become familiar with. Uh, I won't go through this slide, but again, it deals with the privacy, it deals with what information safeguards, uh, NPI rules, uh, and the uh, how things should be encrypted, what else should be covered under PHI. So HIPAA is one of those rules that uh, you definitely want to make sure that you are fully aware of. Now, the High Tech Act was part of the Stimulus Act, and there were four parts to the High Tech Act, of which we're really only concerned with Subtitle A and Subtitle D. Uh, Subtitle A is all about promoting health information technology, and what it did was it established this concept of meaningful use for the EHR systems. So in order to receive the payments, uh, the incentive payments, you had to qualify under the meaningful use criteria, and there were three stages. We're currently in Stage 2. What happens here is that the high tech basically said there's certain criteria that need to be followed. For example, you need to be able to send an electronic record. You need to be able to provide that 80% of your pediatrics uh, um, immunization records are there. Or you need to provide that 50% uh, of your Medicare patients have their information inside of this EHR systems. That's a, those are considered meaningful use. Uh, what this also did was it provisioned for this health information exchanges. The health information exchanges, and this is not to be confused with the health insurance exchanges, health information exchanges were supposed to be central repositories whereby providers would send data uh, to these central databases uh, that are either run by hospital systems or not by hospital systems. They could be private, uh, which are uh, subsidized by the states or by some group of, say, hospitals. So it, it provisioned for the fact that it was going to give money to actually establish these so that the information exchange of health records would be more facilitated and would be easier to integrate to. It also legislated the Office of National Coordinator of Health Information Technology. While this was done by executive order in 2004 where it created this office, this is the first time that it was legislated and said, no, now we're actually going to make this as part of the uh, cabinet, uh, not part of the cabinet, but part of the Health and Human Services. Uh, a domain. Uh, it also established HIT policies and standards committees. So there are committees that are established to ensure uh, the progress and, and future evolution of policies and standards. 
With regards to privacy, it established the criteria by which electronic data should be secured. And so what you will find is that certain, uh, certain criteria are now uh, mandated for securing data. So one of the examples is wireless technologies. You cannot send HIPAA data over a WEP encryption on wireless networks. It has to be WPA or WPA2 or higher. Um, it also provided procedures of notification upon breach and established tiers of penalties for breaches. And what we're finding here is that while that started with HIPAA, we're seeing more and more regulations around the way penalties or uh, breaches are, uh, penalties are assessed for breaches and how breaches are supposed to be reported and what constitutes a breach. So another set of rules are Sarbanes-Oxley and the model audit rule. Um, these are around financial reporting requirements, and they are very, very strict about what needs to be produced. Now, Sarbanes-Oxley is basically a financial reporting requirement for uh, public firms. The model audit rule is not for public firms, but it borrowed much of the SOX language. It's very, very similar, and it's really applicable to insurance companies. So from an information technology perspective, these regulations provide guidance on internal controls of systems. These controls include change management. So how do we go about making changes to systems, uh, especially those that are financially material to the company? Um, we also determine access to systems and segregation of duties. So, for example, developers should not have access to production. We want to make sure that production uh, systems are separated so that there is no risk of a developer manipulating the systems. We also provide controls for network and database security to determine who has access and who doesn't. Uh, and automated controls. So we want to make sure that uh, there are controls in place uh, for monitoring of systems. We also have controls over end user, end user computing, for example, passwords for custom reports and Excel spreadsheets. The Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Act established a voluntary reporting system to assess and resolve patient safety and healthcare quality issues. What this was designed to do was allow a, a method by which reporting of incidents and adverse events that occur with medical errors and so forth could be safely reported and that information can be collected. Uh, what they did was they established these patient safety organizations that will receive these reports of these events uh, from the healthcare providers. And again, these reports are submitted either through web-based portals or through integrated systems uh, they, where the information can be transmitted electronically. Reports of these adverse events are usually extracted from these EHR systems and the clinical records where necessary are transmitted to the PSO. And so these clinical events are done in an HL7 standard uh, where the event and uh, uh, the event and the information is passed on, and then there's some ancillary information, uh, the record of the event, how the event was handled, and, and what the um, other items may be associated, along with the patient's record to determine history, to determine what could have been done to prevent it. Now, the AHRQ is the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. So this is now a quality organization. And the reason this is important is because what we find now is that there's more of a shift from fee-for-service to a pay-for-performance type of uh, methodology. And so what hospitals will do is they will send to the agency uh, their data in an effort to measure against benchmarks for quality. So the indicators that the AHRQ has sent are prevention quality indicators, which deal with uh, prevention of incidents, inpatient quality indicators, which deal with uh, the hospital admissions and how the events are dealt with at a hospital, uh, patient safety indicators, obviously and pediatric quality indicators. So all of these are used, they're used by payers and they're used by the government and they're used by a number of organizations to assess how well hospitals are doing uh, and it's also used by some payers to determine well how well is their population doing in terms of trying to manage their care for say diabetes, obesity, uh, asthma or even pediatrics. So you'll see a lot of these quality measures start to take more hold because uh, they'll use these measures to determine uh, performance benefits for both the payers who deal with a Medicare role or a Medicaid role or uh, Child Health Plus, as well as for hospitals when they're trying to get better payments from the payers and from Medicare.